just sitting in that window and we'll wait at you in terms of sound. Okay. Jason. Um, you can't speak today. I've, I've been up since about 11 p.m. Pacific time, so we'll see if I can make it all the way through without passing out. Um, so as Jason said, uh, I'm from the University of Wisconsin Stout. Uh, also, uh, I've put on here a hashtag, and uh, I'd like to invite you to ask comments, or ask comments, ask questions or make comments. Uh, using Twitter uh, with that hashtag if you want to kind of follow along or, or back channel a little bit along with this talk, that'd be great. Plus, I'll uh, post some things on there, um, kind of resources that you can catch up with um, related to the, some of the things I'm talking about today. So, again, as Jason mentioned, I'm from the University of Wisconsin Stout, uh, kind of one of the smaller system schools uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, there, I work in engineering, uh, largely with mechanical engineering, but uh, also with our other engineering degree programs. Uh, I do some work uh, in design, so design from an education standpoint, uh, also design uh, as a practice, uh, some work in robotics, uh, medical devices, um, and again, kind of some stuff around engineering, engineering education and, and how we approach that. And I don't want to, though, spend this talk really talking about myself because what I really want to talk about today is this idea of open engineering, open access as it applies to engineering, uh, because that is one of the things that I'm passionate about. Uh, so through what I'm talking about today, I hope to uh, give you a little bit of the background as to you know, what do I mean by open engineering when I, when I use that term, uh, why might we care about that, uh, what are those, those reasons that we should think about, you know, how open we are with our engineering scholarship, and uh, then towards the end, hopefully give you some idea of how, how you can be more open in your engineering scholarship and some of the tools that are available to you uh, and maybe some examples of, of different things that people have done and are doing uh, in this direction. So first, thinking a little bit about, about the what. You know, what is open engineering? 
Uh, I try to keep, at least when I'm defining it, and again, this is completely from my perspective, uh, I try to keep it as simple as possible when I think about what is open engineering. And I think about it from the perspective of make your work accessible. So make it accessible so that others can use it and, and learn from it and, and do things with it. So what do I mean by accessible? Well, I mean uh, accessible in kind of three, uh, three different ways. One is uh, maybe our traditional thought process behind accessible, which is obtainable, meaning someone else can gain access to it in some way. They can download it. They can uh, copy it from somewhere. They can read it. They can do whatever with it. Uh, but accessible can also mean understandable. So if I give my work, maybe in written format or whatever, to someone else, can they understand what I'm talking about? Uh, am I using, say, a lot of heavy jargon in my language such that uh, they can't really parse what I'm trying to say? Uh, also accessible uh, can mean reproducible. So am I providing enough information uh, that someone else could recreate whatever it is that I've done? Um, it's easy sometimes to say, you know, the only output of what we do is maybe that final technical report or that, that final journal article or uh, whatever it is that I'm producing there. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my work could be reproduced. I'm not giving someone all of the details that they need to, to make that work uh, uh, again in their own way. So one thing I do want you to keep in mind, though, uh, in that I'm going to present probably a, a number of different ways in which uh, people are open uh, when it comes to engineering scholarship. Uh, but I want you to keep in mind that there's no, there's no wrong way to do it. Uh, you can do it at any level that you feel comfortable with. You can make your, your own work, the things that you do, as open or as closed as you want, whatever fits, fits your personal lifestyle. Uh, I'm not here to say that you have to, you know, live stream everything you do with a webcam or something. You don't have to wear a GoPro on your head as you walk around. Uh, find the level of openness that works for you and your workflow and maybe start incorporating new ways of being open. And always keep in mind that there are uh, a number of other people, both inside and outside of engineering, that are more than willing to help you with it, to help you find the tools, find the resources, find the things uh, that will help you be more open in your own work. Uh, with that in mind, uh, kind of keeping in this idea of be as open as you want to be is I want to reiterate that openness is a, is a spectrum and you can be anywhere or fall anywhere on that spectrum and, and how it applies to, to your own work. So what I would consider probably the, the lowest form, not that's, that sounds negative, but I don't mean it negative, uh, the lowest form of being open in engineering is to just make sure that all of those, those things you write, those reports, those, those articles, those uh, artifacts that come out at the end of a project uh, are somehow accessible to people. And publishing in a traditional journal doesn't necessarily mean your work is going to be accessible to people because uh, generally that means that work is behind a paywall in, in many cases. Uh, and being behind a paywall automatically closes off a large portion of the academic community and the public in, uh, more specifically. Um, makes it so that they can't get access to that work. So I want, to, want you to keep that in mind, that there's kind of this base level of, okay, I'm going to make my work, uh, make sure there's a version of it out there that people can access. Uh, can do that through pre-printing and, and or through self-archiving, and I'll talk a bit more about those in a minute. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is something called uh, sometimes open notebook science. You could think about it as open notebook research, and of course, since we're talking about engineering, we might call it open notebook engineering or whatever you want to whatever you want, label you want to put on it. What that means is this idea that basically everything you produce through the practice of your work and through your research is publicly put out there and, and made available as soon as it exists. So, for example, an experimentalist, uh, as they collect data from an experiment, they might publish that data online uh, through a blog or, or, their other, or some other form of website. They make it available immediately. Uh, say you're a hardware person, a design person. You do a new CAD file. You put that CAD file online in a way that other people can download and gain access to it. Uh, all of that stuff happens kind of in real time as it's produced. Uh, some of the benefits of doing things that way is that uh, it allows other people to kind of watch your progression. Uh, not only gain access to the products that you produce, but the methodology that you use to get there. Kind of that, 
that hidden engineering knowledge that is just in the day-by-day -day process of, of how you do your work. Uh, so there's a lot of value in those uh, pieces of information that don't normally get reported out anywhere. So that's kind of the, the two ends of that spectrum that, that uh, I want you to keep in mind. All right, so a little bit on why. We've talked about what open engineering might be, the different ways we can define it, uh, but why might we think about conducting ourselves uh, professionally in this way? First, you want to have impact. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but I know that one of the reasons I got into engineering is because I wanted to be able to help people. I wanted to be able to have an impact with my work, do something that was meaningful, uh, get meaning, personal satisfaction out of my work. Uh, so having impact is one of those things that I, that I wanted for myself. And making our work openly accessible to other people is one way to, to increase our impact. And I'll show some examples of that uh, a little bit later. Uh, ways that one of the ways we can have impact again is by making sure that other people can access our work and, and use it in their own ways. Um, so I've already mentioned that many times uh, journals that operate on a subscription model where your work is locked behind uh, a paywall cuts out a lot of different people. Uh, we've seen actually uh, on campus today there's a, uh, a conference called uh, Open Global South, so open access in the global south. Uh, what that means is that there's a lot of research institutions uh, in the southern part of the world, and many of those institutions do not have subscriptions to uh, the journals that we publish a lot of our work in because these subscriptions are expensive uh, and they otherwise don't have access to them. That means that there's a whole group of researchers that don't have access uh, to that, those normal uh, venues for engineering work. Uh, however, it's not just researchers that we should necessarily be thinking about as our audience who who the people are that are going to consume uh, the work that we produce. There's also uh, the non-academic community. So hobbyists, uh, people who want to, to build something at home because they, they think it'll help uh, their daily lives somehow. Uh, people in developing nations who want to uh, develop a technology to try to have a new source of income, uh, somehow raise up uh, the... the, the level of, of technological excess uh, their community has. Uh, so there's lots of different examples of this non-academic community that could really benefit from the work that we do, the work that we uh, are funded to do in these sort of settings. Uh, and again, uh, there's all sorts of motivated individuals out there from these different communities that uh, could reproduce our work in some way if only they had the tools uh, available to do so. Looking at it from a slightly different perspective, uh, tying it back to maybe um, international or national law and different things like that, interpreting laws that we're all subject to. Uh, my first example is here is from the, the UN Universal Declaration of Human, Human Rights, uh, which has a statement that says, everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life uh, of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. So one way to interpret this squeaky spot on the floor there, uh, one way to interpret this is that the stuff that we produce as uh, creators of technology, which, which in many cases engineers are, uh, at some level should be freely available to everyone to have access to. Uh, you could perhaps, uh, in a harsh interpretation of this, view it as a human rights violation if people are not able to access the knowledge that we produce uh, as a learned society. Maybe looking a little bit more close, uh, closely, uh, closer to home, uh, the, a combination of the Morrill Land Grant Act, which was uh, an act from 1862, uh, which established uh, funding for land grant institutions. Uh, so many of our edu uh, university educational systems uh, large universities, I think the entire University of California system, uh, are land-grant institutions. So uh, what that means is that they're, they're funded through this mechanism. Uh, as well as the Smith-Lever Act, which was a, a modification or an addition on top of the uh, land-grant act, uh, has a statement that says, to aid in diffusing among the people of the United States useful and practical information. So a component of this that's tied to this whole educational model that supports the university system is that the information that we produce 
should be diffused or, or disseminated to uh, the people of the United States. So again, it's kind of speaking to this idea that uh, taxpayers and just people in this country have uh, some right to have access to the knowledge that we produce. Taking a slightly different look at it, uh, in engineering we have lots of different codes of ethics. Uh, the language in many of them derive uh, or at least have some components such as this, the paramountcy clause which usually appears up like number one in the code of ethics, hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So another way to interpret this could potentially be it is our duty to ensure that the public uh, uh, has the ability to, to be safe, be healthy, uh, pursue happiness, all of those sorts of traits that we consider rights. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to ensure that they have uh, the ability to access the technology that we create. Um, engineers, as creators of technology, sometimes uh, exclude certain populations, either by their inability to access the technology that, they, that we create, or their inability to protect themselves from the downsides of the technology that we create. So when we do that, we need to keep in mind those, those people and those perspectives. How can we ensure that they have access to the technology that we create? Um, perhaps, you know, something as simple as providing a production manual or design drawings or something like that. Uh, and also maybe how do we protect them from those downsides? All right, so uh, getting back to my, my main argument uh, of what is accessibility again, uh, the second component or another component of that is uh, that we want to create work that is reproducible. So reproducible means that uh, we've created something, it worked out great, we're really excited, now what happens, right? We cap it off, we hand it off to someone else, and our goal would be that maybe someone across the country, someone around the world could take what we've done and reproduce it. Uh, they could build the same thing and get the same result, right? Or do the same work and get the same result. Parts or components of that, depending on the type of work we're talking about, uh, could mean that we need to make sure that all components of the work are available. Again, getting back to this idea of what is uh, the, the product of our engineering work, we could be thinking about things like solid models, CAD models, uh, methodologies, experimental methodologies, uh, material formulations, um, computational methods, all those sorts of things that we produce through our engineering work, are they accessible? Can someone else do the same thing? Uh, that could mean using open source softwares rather than uh, expensive proprietary softwares, those sorts of examples. Uh, thinking about the workflow, can the workflow be replicated? Uh, one component of that is, have I made the workflow available? Do they even know what I did, right? So documenting the work that we've done and somehow making that available as part of this, this piece of knowledge that we put out there. Uh, this isn't even necessarily uh, need to be thought of as a purely altruistic en en endeavor, right? Think about yourself. Say you want to come back to this work that you did uh, 20 years from now. Will you be able to, right? Will you have left yourself enough of a paper trail, uh, for lack of a better phrase, to reproduce your own work and to arrive at the, the, the results again. Uh, think about the types of uh, file formats that you use. If you're using uh, storing your data in Excel files or Google Doc files or uh, any number of other proprietary formats, there's a pretty good likelihood that 20 years from now those files won't be readable. You won't be able to open them with any sort of modern tools or, or, or computer programs. Uh, but if you store, say, this is just an example, if you store your data in flat text files, most of those files uh, we've been able to save and open you know, over the last 20, 30 years, and there's a pretty high likelihood that we will be able to in the next 20 years as well. So thinking about uh, what sort of file formats uh, are reproducible and, and will stand the test of time. So kind of putting all this together, uh, in terms of open access, uh, this is an, an image I borrowed from a resource that, I, that I'll link to later or is linked in the slides. Um, there's lots of different reasons that we might uh, uh, pursue open access, and I've talked about most of these already. 
Uh, but I do want to mention uh, a little bit more specifically one of these, which is, again, it doesn't even need to necessarily be a purely altruistic endeavor. Uh, it's been shown through research studies that uh, conducting reach, research in an open access way actually leads to higher citation counts, which if you are uh, an academic or envision your, your future uh, as being an academic, uh, citations are kind of our currency uh, in a lot of respects. Maybe they shouldn't be, but currently they are. And publishing open access actually uh, can have benefits there. Uh, if we work in a, in a public university system, making your research accessible can help influence uh, government policy. So if your legislators have access to this work that you've produced and they find value in it, they may be more likely to, to publish uh, or, or, excuse me, to uh, make funding available for these types of efforts in the future. Uh, it's one thing, the interesting things I learned is that uh, in many cases, legislator, legislators that want to access uh, research that comes out of the universities, most of the time they don't actually have the ability to get through those paywalls without paying for them. And of course, they're under constrained budgets as well, so they're not going to pay $35 per paper that they might want to look at. So uh, there's actually evidence that uh, in many cases they don't have, can't get access to the things they want. Uh, besides the fact that uh, there's an increasing number of uh, reasons or mandates in order to make your work open. So things like uh, grant giving agencies are starting to mandate that their work be made public. Institutions such as universities are starting to, to mandate that their work be made public. And really in, in some senses I think that they should. Uh, much of the work that we do is, is publicly funded and, and therefore uh, the rights, uh, the public has some rights to have access to it. All right, so again, I've gone through a little bit of background on what is open engineering and you know why might we do it. Now I want to spend a little time on the how. So if you're interested and this is something you think you want to to look more into, hopefully I can provide some resources that will help you along that that pathway. So again. Getting back to my, my definition of accessible, think about these three aspects of how to be more accessible. Make, how to make your work more obtainable, how to make it more understandable. Uh, a component of, of being understandable is thinking about your audience. You have a scientific technical audience, you have a lay public audience, uh, you have lots of different audiences that, that might uh, be looking to access your work. And again, how to make your work reproducible. Thinking about it from a, an obtainable standpoint, uh, some of the stuff I've already mentioned, such as pre-printing and self-archiving. Uh, when I say pre-printing, what I mean is, is posting a version of your paper uh, before it uh, goes to formal peer review. Uh, self-archiving is kind of doing it on the back end after it's peer-reviewed and, and things like that, making a version available. Uh, publishing open access, so when when possible, making your work available through open access venues. Uh, there's an uh, ever-increasing number of, of open access journals out there, um, seemingly new ones every day or at least every week. Uh, so there's lots of different options out there. And then this last point, which I've been trying to iterate all along, is this idea of opening up all the other artifacts that you produce. So kind of stepping your way towards the more open end of that spectrum what sort of other pieces of information that you generate could you be making uh, open and available? So I want to spend a little bit of time on preprinting just because it's, it's kind of one of those rapidly developing areas right now. Um, preprints, again, are the idea that you, you make a version of your work available pretty much at the same time that you would submit it to a journal. So you've written your paper, you're planning to submit it somewhere, so at the same time that you submit it to the journal, you submit it to uh, an archive. How many of you have heard of archive? A good number of you. So archive is uh, a preprint server that serves physics, mathematics, and computer science for the most part. Um, so they have uh, been around for something like 20-some years, 
and they've kind of become a standard. So in physics and in, in uh, mathematics, there's very much this culture of you make everything available as a preprint right away. Uh, that way you can access the, the, the most advanced work in your field immediately. Some of the benefits of doing that are that it speeds up that process. So if you're looking for the most advanced work, uh, the, the most cutting edge stuff, you go to archive if you're in physics and you find that uh, you know, newest paper. It might be six months before it shows up in the journal that it was submitted to, but today it's on archive, so that's where you go to find it. Uh, when we think about preprints, generally we should say that we should license them to be open and reusable. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Uh, preprints can set a record of priority. Uh, what that means is that it kind of establishes your priority, the fact that you did this first sort of thing. Uh, sometimes in science uh, and engineering, there's, there's this need to, to be first to discover something. Um, so it provides that. Uh, sometimes people worry about this idea of being scooped. Uh, if you've ever heard that terminology, uh, what it means is that they're afraid that if I put something out there too soon, someone else with you know, a bigger lab and more funding will uh, pass me by and, and get the work out there faster than I could. Um, but in reality, what most fields that have adopted preprinting see is that it actually prevents being scooped because you've established your priority by putting your name on it uh, first when you put, put that preprint out there. Uh, in many cases, preprints can provide access to uh, these work products that we produce that might be lost. So say, for example, you publish it in a journal that you know, five years down the road goes under, uh, they might lose all of their content. Well, your preprint might still be out there for other people to access. Um, hopefully, you know, it's funded by a model that, that supports that. Uh, preprints do not necessarily um, mean that the work is low quality. Uh, in fact, they really don't have much of a correlation to quality at all. Uh, there's not too many great measures of what is quality of a work. Uh, in an academic setting, a lot of times we, we use a journal impact factor as a proxy for quality of the work. Uh, but there's actually research that shows that journal impact factor correlates negatively with quality of the work. There's uh, a greater number of retractions in higher impact journals. Um, so that's not a very strong, uh, strong metric to use. It uh, supports uh, the rapid evaluation. So in cases where there is work of low quality and it gets put out there as a preprint, the community has the ability to look at it very quickly, maybe before uh, expending a lot of resources on the peer review process, which is kind of a, a time and money uh, intensive process. The community is able to evaluate those results quickly, maybe identify problems before it even ever makes it into a, a, a published work. Uh, this idea of preprinting precluding publication, uh, in all honesty, this is something you need to be aware of. There are publishers who will basically say that because you put this out there as a preprint, you cannot publish uh, with us. Those are becoming fewer and further between uh, as, again, uh, grant agencies start to mandate uh, open access policies and, and different things like that. Publishers are becoming more and more accepting of preprints being posted out there. And many of the, the very large publishers do have policies which um, completely allow you to preprint your work. Um, one of them that has kind of an ambiguous policy right now is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Uh, I'm working on that one. We're, we're discussing possible options there. But um, generally, there's a, a good resource uh, for looking up that sort of thing. Uh, it's called Sherpa Romeo. Uh, I'll link to it on Twitter. Uh, it's a good resource for uh, searching publisher preprinting policy. So you can search. It'll bring up a, a, a listing that tells you what their policy is in regards to what you can and cannot archive uh, per their copyright transfer agreements. Um, many grant agencies are actually starting to look very favorably on preprints. Uh, so they're starting to allow you to cite preprints in... Uh, in your body of work when you apply for a grant. Uh, and many of them are also supporting the citation of preprints uh, in that work. Uh, I think some of them view it as 
you know, this person is maybe even further on the cutting edge because they're citing work that isn't even in the formal published literature yet. Uh, but whatever their reasons, uh, it's starting to become a positive. Uh, but again, and again with preprinting, uh, it's important to realize that you do what's appropriate for your workflow and what's appropriate uh, for the, the specific disciplinary uh, field that you work in. Uh, all of those things are uh, options for you. All right, the next point, thinking about how to make your work understandable. Uh, again, I, I talked about this a little bit already, but think about it from the perspective of who is your audience. Uh, you may have a, a, a technical audience. You may have uh, a lay public audience. You may have a science communicator audience. Whoever you want to read and respond to your work, uh, think about what sort of level of technical understanding they're going to bring to it and what sort of things they're interested in. Uh, many cases, you, it may be wise or, or um, beneficial to prepare a second version of whatever work you're, you're writing up, uh, which uh, uses language that's more accessible to a wider uh, selection of the, of the population. Uh, the volume of work that we produce as a research community these days is so great that we really can't expect that you know, the professional science communicators are going to be able to disseminate and, and translate all of it for us. So we have to, as researchers, take on some of that work ourselves. How are we going to make our work accessible to a wider uh, audience of people? So uh, one of the things I'll talk about in a little bit is a possible venue for doing that. Uh, but it's also uh, sometimes as simple as you know, using a, uh, a blog or your lab's web, uh, web page to you know, provide a link to the published work and then a description of it in a, in a more understandable language, focusing more on the applications and the implications and less on the, the technical nitty-gritty. And I've mentioned some of this already, but uh, thinking about the concepts of reproducibility, how you can make sure that your workflows are reproducible, uh, using software that is accessible to people. Uh, I know a lot of people really like to use, for example, MATLAB for all their computational work. MATLAB's very expensive for people not in an academic setting. So if they want to recreate your work or run your code, in many cases they can't. So uh, look at some of the alternatives that are available, things like Python or Octave or, or any of the other um, open languages that are available to us. And think about it from the perspective of someone who's going to be looking at your work from the outside in. What sort of things are they going to need in order to do your work? Uh, what sort of resources might they need to have access to or training or, or understanding will they need uh, in order to, to reproduce whatever it is you're working on? So thinking about the format, uh, everything from file format to, to um, you know, materials that we use, uh, what sort of format will be accessible to other people? What things can you produce and put out there uh, that others will be able to access? How will other people find it? Uh, again, I'm going to point to in just a minute a number of resources for this, but how are people going to interact with your work? Are they, is it in a format that they can download or somehow access? Lots of tools are available. You've probably heard of some of these. Um, Figshare is a good example of... Uh, putting things out there. It supports all sorts of file formats, presentation files. Uh, if you go on Twitter and look under the Open, Engineer, Open ENGR uh, hashtag, you'll find a link to these slides that are on Figshare right now. Um, Open Science Framework is kind of a, a project management system for uh, managing uh, all the different products of, of uh, your work. It also feeds in some of these other data sources, GitHub and, and Figshare. Um, many of you are pro probably familiar with GitHub. Uh, kind of strongest use in the, in the open source code community, and not, not necessarily open source, but uh, in the uh, software and code community um, as kind of a workflow there. Uh, interesting, though, you can also upload STL files to GitHub, and it'll display them. It'll even do diff. Uh, views between two files. So say you make a change or a revision to an STL file and upload that new version, you can slide back and forth between the two versions to see what was changed. So it's, it's starting to become a tool even for people working in hardware. Uh, ORCID is a, a research identification method. Uh, 
it's a way to establish who you are, especially if you have a common name. It's a really good thing to, to think about who you are across your work. Granting agencies are starting to use ORC, uh, ORCIDs and other uh, resources are using those too. Uh, Jupyter Notebooks, they're uh, good from a reproducible, re can't talk, told you I was going to struggle, uh, from a reproducibility standpoint in that uh, you can contain the code and the output all in one place. Uh, you can make it interactive so other people can change variables, change things, and, and get a different result but use the same basic premise. Um, this last one uh, I'm actually going to talk more about in a, in a couple of slides, but uh, the short story is that it's basically a way to take a snapshot of whatever software you were using when you produced a result and provide that snapshot to the next person so that they can use the exact same thing. So... Say, say, for example, you were using version 3. Point whatever of Python, and they you know, want to redo this two years down the road when the most recent version is 3.x plus 2 or something like that. Uh, this provides a way to snapshot what you did, so if there's any changes that happened in the software that might affect the results, they're contained there. All right, so where am I in all of this? Uh, I'm working on something called open engineering. And open engineering is used to encapsulate a variety of things, tools that are available. Uh, one of them is the Journal of Open Engineering. Uh, for me, it's kind of an experimental journal trying to push uh, the boundaries of open scholarship, how we publish in engineering. Uh, in that regard, it's you know, completely open access, no fees on either end. Uh, to submit and publish or to subscribe and receive. Um, it uses open uh, peer review, uh, post-publication peer review, meaning the work is published first, uh, available online, open for comment, and then eventually former, formally accepted after that peer review process. Engineering Archive. Many of you have heard of Archive, as we discussed. Engineering Archive is meant to be the engineering version of that. Uh, unfortunately, Archive, with the disciplinary uh, boundaries that it has, doesn't cover much of engineering. It covers some of the, the, the physics uh, or the, the branches of engineering that are close to physics and the computational stuff that's co close to computer science. Engineering Archive is meant to encapsulate all of engineering, uh, so that is available um, for engineers to use as a, resource, as a repository. Uh, this is something kind of newer that I'm working on. Uh, it's in the direction of having a lay or public version of uh, a document that you, you publish. So the idea is you publish an article, and then you come here and write more the, uh, the accessible version of it. Uh, shorter, more to the point, uh, more accessible language. Where we'll go with uh, this idea of open engineering in the future, I don't know. Uh, but what we're trying to do is build a community. Build a community of people who are interested in making their work open and accessible and having that sort of impact and creating the tools uh, that are necessary to, to enable them to do that. So if you look uh, or search pretty much any of these terms, you'll find, uh, find some of these resources and, and hopefully uh, have the opportunity to, to make use of them. So... I did want to highlight some examples uh, of things that are out there that people are working on that take into account or into mind some of these, some of these things I'm talking about. Uh, the outcomes from this type of work are, are pretty interesting, and I'm, I always love reading about uh, new ways in which people are using openness to, to impact the world in a greater way. So this first example, uh, Pat Delaney. Uh, he's an individual who's not trained at all as an engineer. Uh, he's, a, he's a technologist. He uh, had a desire to, uh, basically in retirement, to make tools available to people. His basic premise or his, his founding philosophy is that if someone has access to a lathe, they can make and do anything. A lathe makes round parts. Round parts can be used to make a milling machine, for example, and from there they can make anything they want. So... Uh, he design, designed over a number of years uh, what he calls a multi-machine. Uh, you can maybe kind of tell here, but this piece here is an engine block. 
He discovered through uh, some research on some, some old practices that engine blocks make great bases for this type of thing because they're very precision machined. They have several cylinders that are very close in parallel with each other, and they're very easy to come across in a scrapyard. So uh, he designed this machine that is a, uh, in different configurations, can be a horizontal mill, an end mill, a drill press, a, uh, a lathe, uh, a number of other tools uh, such that someone could make this machine for themselves and turn it into a business wherever they are. Uh, so he designed this, uh, this machine in a variety of configurations, built it, and makes the plans or made the plans available online for free so that anyone could download them, get the parts, make the machine themselves. So it's a really cool example of how uh, someone with a passion for, for trying to help others by helping them help themselves uh, made his expertise available to other people and, and allows them to do that. Uh, from this and, and with other like-minded individuals, there's kind of this whole cottage community that sprouted up uh, around designing open source tools so that people can use them to make other things. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Moore pointed out or reminded me of, a, of another project called Open Source Ecology, uh, which is an act in active development. And what they do is they work on uh, kind of all the equipment and tools around being able to uh, operate a, a farm and other building resources and things like that. So it's another resource similar in nature. They want to be able to design and, and enable people to, to build the tools and machines to improve their own lives. Uh, Lorena Barba, uh, she's a professor at George Washington University. Um, she does a lot of work in reproducible and rep, uh, replicable uh, computational fluid dynamics. So she's a computationalist and her, her lab does a lot of research in this area. And one of her challenges was trying to find ways to make computational work reproducible so that other people could recreate it. Uh, in theory, it doesn't sound like it'd be all that difficult, right? If you make the code available, someone else should be able to rerun it, right? Uh, but what she discovered along the way is that uh, the intricacies of initial conditions and meshing conditions and software versions and all of those sorts of things can lead to wildly different results when it comes to computational work. So uh, what she has started to do and her lab does is uh, create a reproducibil reproducibility package with the work that she produces uh, and such uh, that it enables other people to, to arrive at the same results if they use the same uh, conditions that she specifies. And that way, uh, when she publishes something, someone else can verify that those results are actually the results that are being described in the paper or, or whatever, that there's no finagling going on. Uh, kind of an accountability piece. Um, that uh, software that I was mentioning before, Docker, is something that you know, makes this possible in, in some ways. It's a technology that makes it possible in that you can supply the code along with the exact versions of the software that you were using uh, in order to, to make that work reproducible by the next person. Uh, the Zambulance Project. Have any of you heard of this? Nobody's heard of it? Oh, that's too bad. Uh, so this was actually a project that Dr. Moore was involved in uh, uh, here. And uh, it, it's a project that initiated out of someone's willingness to share a design, to make a design available for other people to try. Uh, uh, Jessica linked here. Uh, made the designs for this, this bicycle-powered ambulance uh, available on a website. Uh, those were picked up by other people, implemented uh, in Zambia uh, and Namibia, is that right? And uh, in their, uh, in, by doing that, she was able to have, and, and the group that was involved with it, was able to have a much larger impact than they could have had individually. Uh, I think the, the information that that was shared with me by, by Dr. Moore was that uh, there's a company now in uh, Zambia who's produced and sold 900 of these uh, pieces of equipment for other people to, to have that sort of societal benefit, much more than any one individual could, could hope to achieve. So uh, in terms of having impact with your work, here's a great example of that. Uh, Joshua Pierce, uh, this is a professor at Michigan Tech. 
Uh, he has a, a diverse array of projects that he works on, but one of them that I find particularly interesting is the idea of open lab hardware or open research hardware. So what his, one of the uh, things that his lab does is when they are designing uh, a new experiment uh, or a new uh, thing that they want to do, part of that process is designing the hardware that they'll use to do the experiment and then making those plans and those details available. So if they design and build their own hardware, it greatly reduces the cost of doing research. Uh, not having to purchase some sort of expensive equipment. So finding ways to do it in a more uh, accessible, lower cost fashion uh, has enabled them to do research maybe beyond what their normal funding amounts would allow. Uh, and my last example uh, is the, uh, the stethoscope shown here. So you can see if, if you look close enough at this picture that a lot of these components are 3D printed. Uh, so this stethoscope project is actually a, a project that was housed on GitHub primarily. So they came up with this first version, first design uh, of this stethoscope. It's meant to be a low cost, I think it's sub, sub $5, might even be more than that, uh, stethoscope that works uh, comparably to a professional one. And uh, they made the, the design available on GitHub and then over time, other people completely unrelated to, to that specific group, that, uh, that research group, contributed to that hardware design through uh, GitHub workflow. So, you know, if you think of GitHub primarily as a software tool for, for open source contributing to software, this is the open source hardware version of that. How can we as a community design hardware rather than uh, any one individual or any one research group? Maybe open it up so that anyone can contribute and, and lend their expertise. Just like we uh, established pretty well in the open source software community. Um, so this project is, is uh, pretty far along now, and uh, they've had those contributions from, from people all over the world uh, adding in to that design, which I think is pretty cool. All right. Um, some of these other examples, which are linked, which you can find if you download the slides, uh, aren't necessarily directly tied to engineering, but they provide some interesting examples of things, uh, types of work that people have made publicly available. Uh, one example that, again, it might be particularly useful to, to people with an academic uh, career path. Uh, there are several research groups, I've just linked one here, that provide uh, their grant proposals. They, as soon as they submit a grant proposal, they make those publicly available online, uh, such that you can learn from their successes and their failures. Uh, and try to be more successful yourself. Um, other examples, uh, especially for people going on the, the job market at some point, things like cover letters and research statements and, and personal statements and all these sorts of things that, that might be needed. Um, also, there's a little bit of, a, again, a growing community within the research field of, you know, we want to push for open access, right? Well, then in part, there's uh, the idea of putting your money where your mouth is, so to speak, and that is, pledging to be open, meaning that you'll only publish things if they're openly available, you'll only do reviews if it's for something that is openly available, that sort of thing. So uh, an example of an open pledge uh, is linked there. And there's a, there's a number of those out there, and I've just linked to one in particular. So I did want to spend just a moment thinking about, you know, now that I've, I've maybe painted this, this picture of, hey, this is what we should do, what are the barriers to doing this, and I know I'm almost out of time. Um, some of the barriers, uh, it's a change in workflow for a lot of people. So there's some possibly tr uh, needed training for people to, to adopt these sort of workflows, and I think that there's people out there willing to do so. There's, there's uh, lots of good models for that. Uh, career reward structures, particularly in an academic setting, right now the academic reward structures don't uh, reward this type of work very well. Um, I think that can be changed and should be changed, and I talk a little bit about that in a white paper uh, that I wrote a few months ago and linked actually on Twitter. Um, also, capitalism a little bit, right? If we're making everything openly and accessibly available, that sometimes might limit our ability to personally profit from that thing. So uh, in some sense, I think there's a, a need for shifts in the funding structure behind how we fund research out of public institutions. Uh, and what we hope to get out of it, but 
that's a very real barrier that I think needs consideration. So thinking about this idea of capitalism, that of course begs the question of what about patents? My disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, this is not legal advice, uh, which you have to say. Um, when you think about all of these things I've been talking about from the concept of patenting, prior art law still applies, meaning if you put a preprint out there, you are creating prior art, which may prevent you from patenting your device. Immediately in Europe, one year grace period in the US, so that's something that needs to be considered. Uh, one possible benefit is that in the US, though, that preprinting does establish your priority, and you do still have that one year grace period before you uh, submit the patent, so that's one possible um, benefit from that. Uh, and then the one, the closing thought on that, though, that I would leave you with is, is patenting your best route to have an impact? Uh, there was a research report study, uh, published a few years ago that something like the vast, vast majority of intellectual property offices at university campuses are not profitable, which means they exist, but they don't bring in more money than they spend. So I would argue that many times we think something's a great idea and we want to patent it and you know, envision royalty checks for the rest of our lives. That's very seldom the case. So think about how you might have impact uh, in other ways. All right. Some more resources I've linked here that you can, you can view on your own uh, to, to get a, a better picture. A couple of podcasts, these first two, and then a website which provides some good information. And with that, almost a little bit of time, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Sam. I'd like to get one quick question. <laughs> Somebody would like to Um, I fully agree that that's potentially problematic. Um, my, my offer or, or suggestion could be that, you know, that data is posted with a disclaimer that, you know, this is very preliminary, blah, blah, you know, all the standard kind of things you might say if you were showing it to a colleague. Um, explaining the nature of this data. One thing that I think comes out as a benefit from that is that there is knowledge in that process of you saying, here's some data, and then a week later, that data turned out to be wrong. Here's why. Here's the new data with this correction, et cetera. And that sort of process, most of the time, is hidden away in a lab notebook, I would, I would expect. Um, very seldom is that put out there for people to learn from. So I think that there is some benefit to doing that. Now, yes, we have to be careful in how we disseminate these things and make, you know, make sure that information is known. But I think there could, could be benefit in it. I think it would require, maybe, maybe this gets to the idea of needing some training or adaptation of workflows, um, but thinking about you know, what your current workflow is and, and then how that might be adapted to this sort of process. Um, there are some really good examples that I've seen, um, especially from experimentalists, where they basically have their machine that every time they run an experiment and it generates a data file, it literally, the machine automatically publishes that online to their website. Like, there's, there's resources that they've created on their own. But, yeah, there's... there's but that's not, that's not knowledge. That's just, that's just data. To make it knowledge, you need to pass through a little bit of human brainwork. And sure. that is the most important part of the process. You know, that's a cost. There's a cost to that. So if there's any economic, I, I think, um, on the way to results, or I guess an economic cost, it's not necessarily bad, but it's not necessarily bad. We're sure we have to wrap things up. Sure. Thank you.